Hello, hello. Check one, two. Ready? Here we go. Oh, I gotta plug this in. I think Cheyenne's pointing at it. Okay, but make sure you cut that out at the beginning. Oh, yeah, thank you. You're slipping there. What happened? Oh, thank you. My back, thank you. My Everybody, my family, friends, thank you. All right, here we go. Cheyenne and Tyler for helping me with that song. That's pretty funny. I was trying not to laugh. I lost my place a couple times. Play that song without thinking and there, you know. Anyways, all right. Uh, good evening to you all. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24? It's kind of funny because you see the two heads. 
That's pretty funny. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. We're going to uh, wrap up chapter 5 of 1 Timothy uh, this evening by noting verse 25 where Paul teaches that the good deeds of some men are conspicuous and those which are not cannot be concealed. And I'd just like to say, first of all, thank you, Jody and Titus, for this, this awesome little uh, you know, uh, pulpit thing here. I love that. It's perfect and everything. And we got a new mixing board, so... Uh, we, for people on Pal Talk, the sound, and uh, uh, also on, through the website, it's pretty cool because it's going to help us out a lot with the sound. And uh, so, Titus, thank you for that. And uh, so, we're pretty cool. Um, so, we were just yeah, I was, we were here two hours before class started, just working this thing out, the kinks out, and so it's going to be pretty neat. So, um, so that's uh, that's about it. We get remember we got to we're going to be down in Alabama uh, the week of the, what was it October twenty twenty fourth. And we'll be teaching the 25th, 26th, and 27th. And I'm going to do the book of Joel down there. So actually, I'm going to do the journey through the Bible series uh, down in Alabama. I'm going to do the book of Joel. It has only three chapters, which in the theme of the book is the day of the Lord. And it's going to be an awesome study. It's a great book. I've taught on it before in the, in a long time ago. But uh, we're going to do it as part of the journey through the Bible series. We'll knock that book off. That'll be good. And we'll be taking a chapter each evening down there in Alabama. We're going to see our friends uh, Vaughn, Vaughn and Debbie Mancha down there in Alabama. So say a prayer for everything uh, works out fine down there, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. But uh, looking forward to uh, uh, getting near the. I'm already working in the last chapter, First Timothy. This is the six chapters to the book, as you know, and uh, so I'm already getting uh, thinking about what I'm going to do for the next uh, in-depth study right now. Um, so as I've been pointing out when I when I started announcing this journey through the Bible series. We're going to continue to do our in-depth study during the week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings, which is very important, very critical, and I really enjoy doing it. So uh, I've been thinking about what next Old Testament book I'm going to do next, because I like to go back and forth between New Testament and Old Testament. And so I'm thinking of doing, I'm right now thinking about doing Daniel. And, uh, and I know I've touched on Daniel, several chapters in Daniel for the Day of the Lord series, but I've never taught on the book before, and I really there's a lot more in the book besides the prophecy that's in the book too. So there's a lot of cool things in there, and uh, so I'm thinking about that. I haven't made a final decision on that. That's up to God, and uh, we'll see where He has me, what He has me do. So, um, but we're going to uh, finish off First Timothy chapter five this evening by noting verse 25. And again, as I noted a few moments ago, Paul teaches that the good deeds of some men are conspicuous, and those which are not cannot be concealed. And of course. Uh, this is the last, this verse is a part of Paul's discussion about the proper treatment of elders, which began in verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Remember in verses 17 through 18, uh, he did a, uh, he talked about remuneration of elders, that they get are to get paid for their services of teaching the word of God to the body of Christ. And then he talks about the discipline of elders, uh, verses 19 and 20 and 21. And then 22, uh, he talks about uh, the ordination of men to the, uh, to the ministry, uh, and uh, then in verse 23, he gave a parenthetical note about Timothy's health. And then verse 24, as we saw last uh, last week, and verse 25 are both related to the subject of uh, of the ordination of men, that uh, Paul says that uh, you should not ordain men too hastily. So verses 24 and 25 are actually elaborating on what Paul said in verse 22, with verse 23 being a parenthetical note. Uh, so this will be our subject here this evening. So without further ado, let's that take that moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear the teaching of the Word of God. Remember, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, you must uh, get out of your head uh, the pastor, his personality, and uh, too many Christians today are into the personality uh, cult, and they like to make uh, here uh, big uh, stars out of these uh, out of pastors. We're simply servants of God, and we're to be. Uh, vessels used by the Holy Spirit to communicate truth, and uh, this is uh, this takes first of all for myself. I need to be filled with the Spirit, and you also too. For me to teach it, to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, I have to be in fellowship with God, filled with the Spirit, and for you to learn you and to for the Word to take root, you have to be filled with the Spirit and fellowship with God as well. Now, again, filling the Spirit. Letting the word of Christ richly dwell in your soul, which is commanded of us in Colossians 3.16, the command of Ephesians 5.8 to, to be filled with the Spirit, are both synonymous. The passage in Colossians 
is uh, emphasizing the ministry of the word in regards to Christian fellowship. And in Ephesians 5, Paul's talking, emphasizing the ministry of the Holy Spirit in fellowship. Uh, Both are synonymous because, first of all, the Spirit inspired the Scriptures, the Word of God. And he also is the one who, who, uh, in both passages, if you read them, the results results of being filled with the Spirit and letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in your soul, they have the same results, both commands, by fulfilling them. And uh, also, uh, if there's anything that's disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. Paul says something similar in Philippians 4, 6. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but you're to pray. And we sprinkled it with thanksgiving. So with that in mind, with those things uh, uh, said, let's take a moment of silent prayer. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this time, this great uh, privilege that you've given us to study your word. We thank you, Father, for placing us in union with your Son, Jesus Christ, and giving us the indwelling of the Spirit as our true teacher and mentor. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to guide us in this study of 1 Timothy. We pray that this study in 1 Timothy would be a great blessing to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, this evening, we just thank you, Father, for... Uh, the new technology that you've given us, and we just thank you, Father, for the Thompsons opening up their home so we can teach the Word of God. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not only here in Iowa, but other parts of this country and the world who have been supporting this ministry with their prayers and their time and talent and treasure. And we just thank you, Father, for them. And Father, we just uh, pray that you would uh, help us all to learn this evening to learn uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 25, this study this evening. We just pray that you give grace to myself so that I could to deliver your people, to your full counsel to them with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power so that they're built up and edified and you and your son, Jesus Christ, are lifted up and glorified. Help those in the audience to concentrate, to make the proper application. We pray that no one would do anything that's disturbing or distracting to those who are serious students of the word of God. And Father, we just uh, pray, Father, that give Titus wisdom doing with the sound and the recordings. We pray that the technology, uh, this new board we have, we thank you for. We just pray, Father, that everything goes smoothly tonight with the recordings and and, uh, that uh, everything will go according to plan. And we just pray, Father, that as a result of this, uh, during this Bible class, we'd have a great time fellowshipping in your word, continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, Titus, is that shut off? Which one? This, the CD? Yeah, it's off. It's off? Okay, good. All right. I was just curious. It's not playing. All right, because I, I, maybe it was the music in my head. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. Okay, no problem. I was just checking just in case. I didn't think it was, but anyways, I don't know what I was. I just figured I might, might as well ask you. It's better safe than sorry. All right, uh, you should be at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24, if you not haven't been there already. Uh, as I mentioned before, actually, you know, it started verse 17. Uh, instead of t- verse 24, look at verse 17. And let's just read up to verse 25, and then we'll concentrate on verse 25 for the rest of the evening. I, I added in my notes that I was going to start off at verse 25, but let's pick it up in context so, how, so we can see what verse, looks, verse 25 looks like connected to the rest of the paragraph. Because it is connected to the rest of the paragraph, and it doesn't make any sense without it. So look at verse 17. Paul says, The elders... Uh, being the overseers, the pastors, who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at teaching the word of God. Now, preaching is not in there in the, in the original. Uh, it's actually, the word there in the Greek is 
uh, for doctrine. And then it says in verse 18, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So that's uh, those uh, two quotations, one from the Old Testament, one from the Gospels, uh, is used to substantiate uh, Paul's teaching or to confirm or verify Paul's teaching or support Paul's teaching in verse 17 that pastors should get uh, paid for their services of teaching the word of God. Now look at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. And remember, he's following the, uh, the, what the Lord prescribed for church discipline in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. Those who continue in sin after they've been conf uh, confronted by the two witnesses, you're to rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Again, he's following Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, the procedure there for church discipline. So I solemnly charge you, he says in verse 21, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels, the elect angels, to maintain these things, these principles, without bias and doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. His comments there are related to his teaching in verses 19 and 20. Then he goes from discipline, talking about the dis, uh, disciplining elders, to the ordination of pastors, elders, and o who are, in other words, overseers. He says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily. That's referring to the ordination ceremony. And thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sins. Uh, free from sin. So a couple of things are in order there. One, uh, the ordination ceremony is depicted by the laying on of hands, of course. And of course, it's connected, Paul's statements here are connected to what he said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, re with regards to the qualifications that must be consistently met over an indefinite period years by those men with the spiritual gift to pass the teacher and it, for them to assume the office of overseer. So it, those qualifications in chapter 3 would help Timothy and the rest of the Ephesian leaders, the, uh, the pastors there who were already ordained, to, uh, to decide which men should be ordained and which should, men should not. Now, if he doesn't lay his, if he uh, obeys what he just said here, this prohibition, and not laying his hands on anyone too hastily, ordaining men to the ministry too hastily or prematurely, he will keep himself free from sin. Because if he does lay hands on somebody too hastily, what will happen is that when they go into apostasy, Timothy will be held accountable for, would be uh, dealt with uh, because he ordained the man prematurely and he would be disciplined for doing that. And so he's saying, don't be too hasty. Then he, makes, he gives a parenthetical note in verse 23. He says, no longer drink water exclusively, uh, exclusively but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Then, in verses, verse 24, he picks up where he left off with verse 22. Verse 23 is parenthetical. And it's not out of place because the whole epistle is given to Timothy and his responsibilities. So that would not be unusual if Paul threw a parenthetical note in if we realized that. Now look at verse 24. He says, The sins of some men, some men who aspire to the office of overseer, are quite evident, obvious, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Now remember, the sins there are not identified for reasons, for a good reason, uh, because it doesn't matter what the sin is. What matters is that they're sinning. And when he says the sins of some men, he's talking about men who are unrepentant. Let's take, for instance, a man abuses alcohol. He's an alcoholic. Well, the sin, that, uh, when he talks about the, the sins of, he's talking somebody who's sinning as a lifestyle. So let's say a man who abuses alcohol, and he's an alcoholic. Uh, he is an individual who's unrepentant, meaning he hasn't stopped the drinking, abusing alcohol. So that's the idea what Paul think, is, is thinking about here. He's saying that some men, their sinful lifestyle is obvious. For instance, someone who's an alcoholic, some alcoholics can hide it. But over a period of time, it's going to manifest itself, is what Paul's saying uh, uh, later in the, in the verse. But he's right here, he's saying that uh, the sins of some men are quite evident. They're obvious to everybody. Going before them to judgment, that means they lead to discipline. He's not talking about eternal condemnation there, because every believer is saved from that, from the wrath of God, John 3.36 uh, Romans 8 1, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because Paul's talking about pastors here, 
men who want to be overseers, uh, he, he's talking about Christians. So Christians don't go to eternal condemnation. So the judgment there has to be divine discipline. And then he goes on to say, for others, their sins follow after. Meaning, the sinful lifestyles of some men don't manifest itself until later on in their lives. So that's why Paul says in verse 22, don't lay hands too hastily on a man. Give it time. Don't prematurely ordain men. Because the sins of some men are not always obvious. And they follow later on in their life. They'll show up, appear later on in their life. So for that being the case, don't be hasty ordaining men. Give it time. Now, connected to that thought, verse 24, Paul goes from talking about the sins of some pastors, meaning the sinful lifestyle of some men, to the good deeds of some men who aspire to the office of overseer. Look at verse 25. Paul says, Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be con concealed. So he's basically saying the same thing as he did in verse 24, but this time the subject is not sins, it's good deeds. Now, uh, the phrase likewise in verse 25, likewise also, uh, deeds that are good are quite evident, is composed, first of all, of the adverb of manner, os altos. Os altos is translated here, likewise here. And then we have the conjunction ke, which is used in an adjunctive sense, as we'll see. And then we have the articular nominative form of the noun for deeds, ergon. And uh, that word could be translated actions as well. And then we have, it's modified by the adjective kalos, translated good. And then we have, lastly, the nominative uh, form of the adjective prodilos, which is translated here quite evident. It could be rendered uh, uh, conspicuous. Now, the adverb of manner that's translated likewise, the word os altos, it marks a similarity between the good deeds of some men who aspire to the office of overseer and the sins of some of these men. So that's, this word is talking about a similarity. It indicates that the good deeds of some men who aspire to the office of overseer are similar to the sins of some of them, but not identical to. They're similar only in the sense that some good deeds are conspicuous and some good deeds are not. Just like some sins of men are obvious and some are not. So the conjunction ke, translated also here, it denotes that not only are the sins of some men who aspire the office of overseer conspicuous and some are not, but also or in addition, the good deeds of some pastors, or men who get the gift to pass the teacher, are conspicuous and some are not. Now the word therefore works, ergon as we noted. It means works, or it's actually referring to actions. And the word uh, here is referring to actions performed by a man who aspires to the office of overseer. Now this word, ergon, as I said before, is modified by the adjective kalos. And kalos is translated here good. Now sometimes uh, you see in the New Testament the word agathos, that's translated good too. So is kalos. So sometimes the, the, the translators, a lot of the English translators, they don't make a distinction in between, between these word, ag these two words, agathos and kalos. Now, kalos here, it's modifying the word ergon, works, and it indicates that these actions or works performed by these men uh, while they were in fellowship with God and were produced by the Holy Spirit when they exercised faith in the Word of God, and this in turn results in obedience to the will of the Father, which was reveal revealed by the Spirit in the Word of God. So these this phrase... Uh, good deeds, it's speaking about the actions performed by some men who have the gift to pass the teacher. They aspire to be uh, the office, a uh, holy office of overseer. And these individuals are performing actions in their life which are pleasing to God. They're good because of their, of, of a, their divine and quality. They're produced by the Holy Spirit. So you can produce a good work simply by this. When the Spirit speaks to you through the teaching of the Word of God and you obey the Spirit, and in the power of the Spirit, you perform an action that's pleasing to God according to the will of the Father. See, a lot of people try to do good actions, even Christians, 
but it's in the power of their sin nature because they're not doing it because of motivation from the word of God. They're trying to do good works to please or impress somebody, to do something that's uh, going to get attention to themselves. Some people do the good works just for that reason. Some people are doing good works because they have another mo motivation or because they, they like somebody and they want somebody to like them back. So what here, this word's not saying that. This word's saying it's particular quality. It's based upon obedience to the word of God. It's an action that's performed out of obedience to the spirit of God and in the power of the spirit. So this word, good, it speaks of the words, works, or actions that, are the, that the Holy Spirit performed up through these men as a result of their obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ's command to love one another as he loved. So when he says good deeds there, he's talking about deeds that these men did in obedience to the Spirit. And the Spirit uh, speaks and says, you shall love one another as I have loved you, Jesus taught. Jesus said that, of course, in the Spirit. And we see here that this, when, the, when, we obey, when the, these men obeyed that command and they loved their fellow Christian as Christ loved, then they were going, they're producing or performing a good work. So what Paul's saying is that some of these good works are being are showing up in the man's life, and, and they're obvious, and some are not. So this brings out a certain principle. Some Christians, they think that they won't get credit if they do a good work in the presence of somebody. That's, that's absolutely insane. There are some things we can't avoid, okay? There's some things we can't avoid. You know, it, there's some things that are going to happen that you're going to have to do for God in public, okay? So to say you won't, don't want to do something for somebody that's public, I mean, if your motivation is to get attention to yourself, okay, you get the wrong motivation. But God, you're doing something in obedience to God, and it happens to be that you do it, and it's, it's, it's public knowledge. There's not too much else you can do. Like, let's say, instance, you teach children in a prep school. Well, you know, you, you want to serve, and so everybody knows you do that. So what, you're not supposed to do it because you, everybody will know that you do that? Of course, of course you got to do it and, because it's going to help the body of Christ. So that's something you can't avoid. But there are other things uh, that we, can, uh, we don't need to, uh, to let the right hand know what the, the left hand is doing as Jesus taught. There are some things that we shouldn't broadcast, that we tell anybody about. If you do a certain thing, you give a gift to a thing, you don't need to tell everybody what you did. And so, you know, God will, you know, that, that's, when we, uh, that's when we cross the line. So we gotta, these, these good works or good actions are divine in quality. They're done out of motivation from, the, uh, uh, from obedience to the Spirit. Their motivation is love for God and love for one's fellow human being. So this is the idea with the word. Now, uh, like the noun amatia in verse 24, translated sins, the noun ergon here works in verse 25 is related to the qualifications listed by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. And first, verse 24, the sins of some, 1 Timothy 5, 24, the sins of some candidates are described by Paul as very obvious and not obvious. Here in verse 25, he says the, the excellent works of some of these men are very obvious and some are not. So these qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, were given to help Timothy and the Ephesian church to determine which men, with the spiritual gift to pass the teacher, and who aspire to the office of overseer, should be ordained and hold this office, and which should, which should not. Failure to meet many, not all of these qualifications, would constitute sinning. And meeting these qualifications, some, not all of them, would, would actually be an excellent work, a good work, is what Paul would be saying. So remember, everything he's saying in verses 22, 24, and 25 are related to those qualifications because the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 are actually g given as a guideline for Timothy and the Ephesian church and the, the, those who are pastors who are thinking of ordaining men. It gives them as a guideline, a litmus test to have to, to, te to measure these men and find out which men are ready to be ordained and which men are are not. So if we if these men some of these qualifications if they don't meet them they would be sinning. For instance, it says don't be an alcoholic. Well, he can't be an alcoholic. Well, if he's drinking and he's an alcoholic abusing alcohol, he's broken he's sinning because he's broken that qual he's not meeting that qualification. That's why I said some meeting not, not meeting some of these qualifications are sin. However, meeting these qualifications are not all of them but a good many of them are 
actually performing a good work, will result in performing a good work if they're meeting these qualifications. So let's hold uh, our place. Let's hold our place in 1 Timothy 5. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, one, verse 1, please. So the candidate for the office of overseer who consistently does not meet the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 is disqualified, whereas the one who consistently does meet these qualifications is qualified to be an overseer. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, please. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, he, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation, an excellent reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now the very first one in verse, he says in verse 2, above reproach, the first one that talks about someone who's irreproachable in character. That means, it actually summarizes these qualifications. It basically means that he, he, there's nothing an adversary could use that would stick to the guy, with, uh, that would uh, hold to what, uh, to, uh, would, uh, would, um, would hold up against impartial examination. So that's the idea with that word. Now he says level, uh, the word, next word is the, the, uh, he must be the husband of one wife. And that means he has to be faithful in his marriage. Now if he misses, if he doesn't fulfill that, that means he's unfaithful. If he does make it, if he does fulfill, uh, uh, meet that qualification and is faithful to his wife, that constitutes a good work. Not meeting it is sin. See what I'm going, coming from with these, these qualifications? Then he says, the uh, temperate, that means level-headed. And then we have the next one is uh, uh, prudent. And prudent talks about somebody who's wise. They control their emotions. They show moderation. And so if somebody doesn't meet that qualification, that means they're emotional and they're not mo they're, they don't show moderation. They're out of control. And they, they, they're not thinking according to biblical standards. They're, they're thinking according to their emotions. So someone who is involved in uh, not meeting this qualification is going to end up sinning. Whereas someone who's going to keep this qualification is going to end up performing a good work. And then he goes on to say, uh, after prudent, respectable. That talks about someone who's uh, that's responsible. Well, if the, if the man with the gift to pass the teacher and he's a candidate to, for the ministry, if he's, not irres if he's irresponsible and he doesn't meet this qualification, he's going to be sinning. Because let's say he doesn't take care of his family. He's irresponsible. Let's say he's irresponsible in his job. He's not doing his job as under the Lord. He's sinning. See what I'm saying? If he's meeting these, he's doing a good work because he's doing his job as under the Lord. He's, he's a responsible person. He's fulfilling his responsibilities as the word tells him to. And then it goes on to say, hospitable. Don't keep that. It's sin. You keep it. It's a good work. Why? Because it says, the Bible says to be hospitable. It's commanded of us. Able to teach, and that's if, if, if he doesn't have this qualification, that means he doesn't have the gift. So that's not going to constitute sinning. He just doesn't have the gift. The, the guy, if he, he's thinking of being an overseer, if he can't teach, he's not skillful in teaching, then he's not a, he's not a, doesn't have the gift. Next, he says, a, not addicted to wine. He can't fulfill that qualification. He's sinning. He's because he's, then he's an alcoholic. He's addicted to wine. If you meet this qualification, then... You're, you're basically, you're doing an obedience to the word of God. It says, it says not to be drunk with wine. Then he goes on to say, or pugnacious. Uh, that's somebody who is violent. He's saying not being violent. You're not, he's not to be violent. But gentle, that means magnanimous. He's not petty. He's uh, forgiving. He's generous in forgiving insults. Well, if he doesn't meet that qualification, he's going to be sinning. Because then he's going to be petty, and then he's going to be unforgiving. So if he meets this qualification, he's forgiving, he's magnanimous, generous, forgiving insults, he's, uh, he's gentle, 
then he's going to be performing a good work because that's what the word of God teaches us to be, magnanimous. And then it goes on to say, free from the love, uh, it says peaceable after gentle, and then free from the love of money. If he loves money, then he's sinning. He's committing idolatry. We're going to see that when we get to chapters, 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul talks about the motivation of the false teachers. They love money. So he said, if you, uh, if, if you don't meet this qualification, then you're sinning. If you meet it, then you're in obedience to the word of God. He, and then, and, and then the re, like for instance, the not a new, uh, if he can't take care of his own household, uh, right there, he doesn't meet the qualification. And not, uh, if he doesn't meet the qualification, that uh, then he is, he's sinning there because it says he's supposed to keep his, his, uh, manage his own household well according to the standards of the word of God. Remember we studied that? Well, if he's not managing his household with the standards of the word of God, he's sinning because he should be doing that. So all these quali- a lot of these qualifications are related, are, are, all re- helping, are all designed to help Timothy and the Ephesian church to decide who is qualified and who's not to be an overseer. And so if, these, if we're going to find out if these men consistently meet these qualifications, then you've got to give it time. That's why he says in 1 Timothy 5.22, don't be too hasty in ordaining, an, uh, um, ordaining a man to the ministry. So... You put those two together, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, with what Paul's saying in 1 Timothy 5, 22, 24 and 25, you can see that Paul's saying, give it time. Because then, if you give it time, the good works of some men will appear that show they're qualified. Because if you don't give it time, these guys are performing good works. The good works are actually a manifestation that they are ready. But if you are, if you are in a rush, you're never going to see this. Uh, same thing with the sins of some men. Some are obvious, conspicuous, some are not. Give it time, all this will bear itself out. So go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 25. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 25. So the word there, it says, Likewise also deeds that are good are quite evident. And those deeds which are otherwise cannot be concealed. So the word, the phrase that deeds that are good, uh, the word good there is kalos. It means excellent. It's modifying the word for works, ergon. And, it, and it's used, which is used of those men who aspire to the office of overseer and the works they perform during their lives as a Christian. The word kalos, good, or you can say excellent, describes these works as being of the highest moral quality or character because they were done by the power of the Spirit as a result of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ's command to love one another as he loved. The implication is that these works were useful and a great benefit to the Christian community in Ephesus and to the Lord himself. The word agathos is not used here. That speaks of the divine quality of the, of the works. But Kalos speaks of that, but it also says that they're useful. They're a benefit to somebody. These good works are a benefit to the body of Christ and also a benefit to the Lord. So, as was the case in verse 24, the adjective prothelos in verse 25 means conspicuous. It's translated in your Bible, uh, obvious. And, uh, or, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite evident, excuse me. It's translated quite evident. However, here in verse 20, uh, f- uh, however, in verse 24, it was used of the sins of some men with the spiritual gift to pass the teacher who aspired to the office of overseer. But here in verse 25, It's used to the excellent works of some of these men. It describes these their excellent works as very obvious or conspicuous. So it's it's saying that if you do a good work in front of somebody, it's not saying it's sin, or that you're not going to get credit for it. As I said before, there are some things that we do are going to be seen by people, and you can't get around it. Sometimes there's some things you can hide from people. Your good works, but the bottom line is if you're doing it whether it's public, whatever you do, or private, and you're doing it out of obedience to the Holy Spirit and His His teaching in the Word of God, then you're you're producing a good work that's pleasing to God. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to to get rewarded for it. So uh, the excellent works that are very obvious or conspicuous are directly related to these men, the men of these men, their, and their ability to consistently meet the qualifications listed by Paul in First Timothy three one through seven. So a lot of the, meeting those qualifications in First Timothy three one through seven, if they meet a lot of these qualifications, they're going to perform these good works. Now look at verse twenty five, as we uh, 
finish off the verse. It also, it goes on to say, likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those, he says, which are otherwise cannot be concealed. That last phrase, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed, is composed of the conjunction ke, translated here and, and then we have the adverb alos, translated otherwise. And then we have the articular nominative participle form of the verb eho, translated here are. And then we have an aorist passive infinitive, crypto, translated here concealed. And then we have the emphatic negative adverb u, which is emphatically negating the meaning of the present passive indicative form of the verb vinama, which is translated here can. Now the word that's translated end, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed, that word is ke. In the original, it's used here as in an adjunctive sense, like it did earlier in the verse, and that means that the word is introducing a clause that presents an additional description of the excellent works performed by some men who aspire to the office of overseer. The word that's translated there, when it talks about it's uh, the word eho, which is translated are there, he says, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Eho means to possess a particular characteristic, and it's used of the excellent works produced by some men who aspire to the office of overseer, which are conspicuous. The word for otherwise, alos, it modifies this verb, and it indicates that it is referring to the excellent works of some candidates as not possessing the characteristic of being conspicuous. So the adverb alos is modifying this verb eho, and it's functioning as an adverb of condition, and it means otherwise. It pertains to the excellent works of some men who aspire the office of overseer as being different in condition from those which are conspicuous. It denotes that the excellent works of some candidates are not conspicuous. Now the word that's translated can there, uh, the, it says, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed, the word uh, can is dinama, as I said before, it means to remain in the sense of having the continued capacity to do something, to be able to do something, and its meaning is emphatically negated by the adverb u, and u actually should be translated absolutely never, it's emphatic. So therefore, you put the two words together, they denote that the excellent works performed by some candidates, which are not conspicuous, will absolutely never remain hidden. What he's saying is, is that God will bring these things out. Just like he says, you know, you, remember, you know, in Numbers, it says, you know, your sin will find you out. Well, in the same way, good works find their way out. Okay, it's comforting to know because either they're going to show up in, later on, and he's saying that these good works are going to show up later on in the man's life. They they're absolutely cannot remain hidden. So when he says, he says, those, uh, those which are otherwise cannot be concealed, he's saying that those good works by some pastors, some men who got the gift to pass the teacher, they want to be an overseer. Some of these works that they do are good works and they cannot remain hidden. They're going to show up in the man's life. It's going, to sh it's going to show up in his life. That's important because he's saying to Timothy in the Ephesian church that give it time, some men who don't look qualified are actually qualified. Some of their good works don't turn up till later on in their life. They're going to start, they'll, they'll, you'll see it, what they're doing, it'll manifest itself later on, in li at different, later on down the line. And it doesn't always, they don't always show up immediately. So that's important for the Timothy and the church at Ephesus and helping them to, to it's, t it's telling them to wait before you ordain somebody. Or give it time before, you, don't cancel them, don't say a man's not qualified for the ministry when he might be qualified for the ministry. You just haven't seen the good works yet. Because you're not God. You can't see everything, Timothy. And the Ephesian pastors who are already ordained there and they're thinking to ordain a man. Well, some men they think are not qualified. They actually are qualified, is what Paul's saying here. Give it time. Their good works will come after. They'll show up in their life later. So the emphatic negative adverb, ooh, emphatically negates the idea that the excellent works of some men will absolutely never remain hidden. The word concealed there, uh, when it says... Uh, uh, those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. The word crypto is uh, translated here correctly, concealed, and it's used again of the excellent works produced by some men who aspire to the office of overseer as being concealed from public viewing. It's used with the expression cannot be, and together they teach that the inconspicuous excellent works produced by some men who aspire to the office of overseer will as a certainty absolutely never be able to be concealed or hidden. 
So Paul teaches here as we close. He teaches in verse 25 that in direct contrast to the obvious sins of some men, the good deeds of some men are obvious, which demonstrate that, demonstrates that they're qualified to be an overseer. However, the good deeds performed by others are not so obvious, but will show up eventually in a man's life. So therefore, with Paul's teaching here, Timothy and the ordained pastors in Ephesus, who would also be involved in the process of ordaining men, is that some candidates might not appear to be qualified, but in fact are. A uh, lot of times people, uh, they, 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 we're all like this in a lot of ways, we, we, don't, we, we make a, a quick judgment on somebody. And reality, you know, reality, that quick judgment was premature and it's based upon insufficient information. So what Paul's saying to Timothy in the, Ephes the Ephesian pastors, who are involved in the process of ordaining men, you know, don't be hasty in, in making a, ra a decision that this guy's not qualified because you don't see any good works in the guy's life. He might not be as, a, he might not be as a, uh, what we call it, he might not be as an extrovert personality. He might be very reserved. Some guys, uh, some guy, like I'm not reserved. And I mean, I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm reserved. But some guys are more, uh, some more people are more reserved than others. Some people are much more outgoing than others. And so the person that's much more outgoing is, has a better advantage of sh having his good work show up than, say, a man who's much more reserved. And, and each man's got a different personality. So Paul's saying, hang on. Wait, don't be hasty and say this guy is not qualified. You have to see, you have to observe him for a period of time. So what we see Paul doing is that in verses 24 and 25, those two verses go together. Those verses, in those verses, Paul's killing two birds with one stone. First, he wants to give Timothy and the pastors in Ephesus discernment with regards to choosing those men who are qualified and those who are not. Secondly, he wants to give them encouragement because it's not so obvious to determine who's qualified and who is not. Think about that. Paul gives a great warning in verse 22. Don't be hasty in ordaining men. Pre don't be premature in ordaining men. You, you, know, you keep yourself uh, pure, uh, free from sin. Uh, don't ordain too hastily so that you won't be complicit in, in their sins that they commit if they go into apostasy. So that's scary. Because who wants to go into discipline? So he's trying to say, I understand it's not always easy to... It's not always easy to, uh, to see these things in a man's life. And like he said in verse 24, well, eventually the, 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 the sinful lifestyle of some men will show up. So Timothy, and all you have to do is this. And the, the, he's mainly talking to the pastors in Ephesus who are going to ordain that because Timothy knew this stuff. But this is the thing they need to know. Take time. Don't be in a rush. It, and this is what I, I try to bring out um, in the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. I told you that in order for the man to get ordained, he has to, he has to manifest those qualifications that he's meeting them over an indefinite period of time. One year, two years, ain't going to crack it. It's not going to, you've got to give it a number of years because there, you want to see a guy in a lot of different situations. You want to see how he acts in adversity. You want to see when he acts like the way he handles people, how he talks to people. Does he, does he play favorites with people? Does he talk to the rich and doesn't talk to the, the, uh, the, the, the poor? I mean, does he play favorites? Is he, is he one of those, is he a politician or is he a, a true man of God? Because some people think a pastor is great when he's really not great at all. They think a great pastor is someone who's like a politician and, and nothing sticks to him. He always says what the right, you know, always says everything everybody likes to hear. That's, pro, that's a people pleaser. Because a, a man who's a good pastor, he's going to say things and do things that at times people might not uh, uh, like and be offended by, but he's actually doing what God is telling him to do and saying what God tells him to say. So you can't, uh, so, so what Paul is saying to Timothy and the Ephesian leadership here is that I'm giving you encouragement here. He's, he's killing two birds with one stone. First, he wants to give Timothy and the ordained pastors in Ephesus discernment to choose uh, in discern, uh, to determine who's qualified and who's not to be an overseer. And secondly, he wants to give them encouragement because it's not so obvious to determine who's qualified and who is not. 
It's a big, big task. So if they give it time, an indefinite number of years, watching this guy, great. So this tells us something. It says that going to a seminary is great, but you really need to see the guy in action in a church. That's why I say if you're going to go to a seminary, you should be serving in a church at the same time. You know? You should be serving... Because... Just because you get a degree in Greek and the uh, Greek uh, and New Testament and Old Testament and you know you, you got a, a degree in theology, that doesn't qualify you for the ministry. Character does. Christian character. Yes, you need to know your Bible. You need to be a good teacher. You need to know your stuff in the original language. But you need to have good character. Because you could be great in all these other areas, but if your character stinks, that says you're not applying it and you're a bad witness, and your ministry is going to be nothing. It's going to make no impact. Not, it won't make an impact at all. So uh, that what I say is, four years ain't, might not even be enough. Give it a number of years. It might take 10 years. And see, in our day and age, everybody's in a rush. Everybody does, you know, oh, it's going to take me 10 years to study the Bible. We passed the bill. Where, where are you in a rush to go to? You're getting taught the Word of God regardless, let's say it, forget about it, it's me, let's say it's somebody else who's teaching the Bible and it takes them 10 years to get through the whole Bible or get, it takes them 3 years to get through Romans. What difference does it matter? It's an attitude we have in this country, we're in a rush, okay? We're in a rush and it, it hurts the, we're in a rush ordaining men, we're, 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 uh, we're lacking discernment in that area, we're in a rush studying the Bible, we're in a rush everywhere. We want, we call it, I call it microwave Christianity. I want to grow to spiritual maturity overnight. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Nobody grows to spiritual maturity in one year. It's a long process, but we live in a day and age where the world system of Satan, go, 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 rush, 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 rush. They, it says otherwise. It contradicts God. God's in no rush. Look at the story of Moses. How many years did he was in the desert before God? I was reading that today. I'm working on Exodus today. Exodus chapter uh, 3. And I was, remember I was studying in, in, in that passage. And it was 40 years Moses waited around. Now he was a man of action. He was, had a life of privilege. Smart guy. Had it right on top of him. God just put him in the dust for 40 years. You think Moses didn't want to? Did Moses, was God use Moses? Absolutely. But it took a, Moses needed to be trained over a long period of time. This he did. Look at, look, at, uh, look at King David. King David was told he would have the throne. But he had to run for over 10 years away from Saul. He was, had to be trained before he assumed the reins. Spent a lot of time, over 10 years, in the back of the desert. Running from Saul in the hills of Judea. Judea. Running, running back and for, uh, running, running through the hills, trying to avoid getting captured by, by Saul. Kind of like Moses, he was an he was a fugitive from justice, just like David was. Both spent many years getting trained by God. So why are we ordaining men coming right out? They come, right, they get out of college, they go into, they go into, let's say Dallas or some seminary, and immediately we're ordaining these guys. That is irresponsible. These, you're hurting them. You're hurting them. They need to develop their Christian character. What, what are we, why are we in a rush? In fact, I'm a firm believer that it's good to be out. In the, I thank God that I was, before I got ordained, you know, I, was, I spent two decades from my, you know, my 20s and my 30s basically you know, working jobs. I had a study in the morning, study at night, and during the day I'm working another job. I had long hours, long days, but I was young. I could do it. I'm still young. And handsome. And uh, so that, so, <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. And uh, so it, 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 it takes time before God will use you. Now, I remember that, you know, when I look back now, there were many days it was like, you know, is God going to, is God going to use me? And there's still, there's still sometimes I still think that. I still think that even today. You know, you know, am I, am I making any impact? Am I, you know, am I, am I doing anything uh, that, that for God here, am I, am I, I'm, or am I in the back of the desert here waiting for God to use me to do something? You know, it's, you know, I like a like a, a voice crying in the wilderness out here in Iowa, and uh, that's the way you feel. But you know what? You know, God does things in His timing, and so He builds character during the curse of many years, and that's what we need. That's what Paul's trying to tell Timothy 
in the Ephesian church. It takes time. It takes a number of years. So therefore, Paul is instructing, uh, he is instructing Timothy and the pastors in Ephesus who are in the process, who are involved in the process of ordaining men. He's instructing them to be cautious in ordaining men and not ordaining men. Being, being cautious in, in ordaining men will allow time for the sinful lifestyle of some men to surface, which disqualifies them to be overseers. On the other hand, it would also allow time for the good deeds of some men to surface as well, which would qualify them to be overseers. So take your time, is what he's saying. Don't be in a rush. One, if you're in a rush and you prematurely ordain a guy, and he goes into apostasy, you're complicit on that. You're going to be held responsible for that, Timothy. And any, and any, any of you guys in Ephesus who are pastors or ordaining guys, if you prematurely ordain a guy and he goes into apostasy, and his, you're going to be complicit in his sins. We saw that in verse 22. You're also hurting these guys. You're hurting them spiritually. They don't have the capacity to be overseers yet. Wait, give it time. Let these guys develop their Christian character. As I said before, a guy might not be ready. He might be ready five years down the line. He might be ready two years down the line. But why be in a rush? Why be, and so if those men who, who might listen to my voice or view this class, if they think they got the gift to pass the teacher, don't be in any rush. Take your time and just prepare, prepare, take, walk with God, and God will let you know loud and clear, like he did with Moses in the burning bush. When, I'm re when he's ready for you, he makes it loud and clear. And uh, just like he did with Moses in the, in, in the burning bush, he'll make it loud and clear. And if he's not ready for you, he's not ready. And his timing is perfect. And uh, it's just like, uh, you know, it's just like writing, waiting for your right man and your right woman. Better to have, you know, better have it right than be with the wrong person for the rest of your life. <laughs> but uh, and the same thing with being a, a, a trying to be, get, enter the ministry. It's better to be, enter the ministry prepared than not prepared. I'll tell you, what, uh, see, if you were dead men pre prematurely, and let's say they go through a church split, if they're not prepared for that, and they don't have the capacity to handle that, they'll leave the ministry. And that's why I'm hearing so many guys who went through church splits like I did have left the ministry. Remember we, quote, we had that quote from Chuck Swindoll? Or was it Worsby? I think it was. And a lot of men leave the ministry. You know, why? Because they didn't have the capacity to start with to, to handle something like that. So when they went through a church, but they flipped out, they, they were like, they were discouraged, they were, they were, um, they, were uh, they, they, they couldn't believe it, they got uh, disenchanted and they leave the ministry. That means that they didn't have, the, they didn't have the, the capacity to be a pastor in the first place. They didn't have the spiritual character, the Christ-like character to deal with that. And because they were ordained prematurely. So the church, if we got men who are ordained prematurely, being pastors over churches, that's going to hurt the body of Christ. Because if the man doesn't have enough maturity, he's going to hurt somebody. He's going to hurt himself, and he's going to hurt others in the body of Christ. So that's why it's very, very important that we're very patient and, and, uh, and very uh, patient and very cautious when we go to ordain men to the ministry. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. Pray that the Holy Spirit would help us understand and put into practice that which we've learned uh, in this study this evening. And we pray, Father, for these things in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen.